Official figures from the US military for the losses of personnel during the 1990-1991 Gulf War are well recorded, with a total of 298 men and women killed and 467 wounded across the services. Losses of equipment, however, are less clear. Wikipedia, for example, lists the loss or disabling of 31 M1 tanks, 28 Bradley IFVs, and a single M113 for US forces. According to the Government Accounting Office, however, of the 3,113 M1 Abrams and 2,200 Bradleys in the theater, 9 M1s were destroyed with 14 damaged, 7 of the 9 by friendly fire, and the other 2 deliberately to prevent capture after being disabled. According to the same report, for the Bradley, 20 of the 28 lost were due to friendly fire, but also that the Army's Office of the Deputy Chief of Staff reported only 20 Bradleys had destroyed and 12 damaged with friendly fire accounting for 85% and 25% of those respectively. In a single report, different figures for losses and damage are confusing enough and may be related to the period of time in which both groups are defining the terms of their analysis. This serves to illustrate a key problem with counting losses even by the winning side, even with few numbers in a relatively well-defined space and time. But if that is not complex enough as counting, consider the single largest loss of M1s, which took place after the shooting war was over, but was still in theater. The incident in question was a major fire at Doha, Kuwait, a fire which destroyed over 100 American military vehicles, including four M1 Abrams, and is likely the worst one-day loss of vehicles suffered by the US Army since World War II. It is worth noting that the war itself was over by the end of February 1991, so it is no surprise that events happening in July do not count in loss statistics for combat, but this has also served to almost conceal this disaster in the aftermath of a successful war. Welcome to a new Tank Encyclopedia voiced article covering this little-known incident involving US forces. If you like our content, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell button, there are more amazing videos coming. Camp Doha was a large, sprawling military compound located at Ad Dawah, a small projection of land jutting out into Kuwait Bay, about 15 kilometers west of Kuwait City. In the immediate aftermath of the liberation of Kuwait from the occupying Iraqi forces, this base was a hub for the US military, buzzing with daily activity. Roughly rectangular in shape, lying along the north-south axis, the base was bounded by the Doha Road to the west, which ran north of the docks, and another road running to the east and going up the peninsula, making the northern half a little wider than the southern half of the base. Divided into two sections, with the southern section consisting of a series of east-west oriented rectangular warehouses with a triangular motor pool in the center, on the very south end was a small UN compound. At the northern edge of the southern compound was a sandy gap, around 200 meters wide, separating it from the northern compound, which had a series of barracks buildings in the north for American and around 250 British troops, a northern motor pool, and two large rectangular motor pools on the southern edge. It was in one of these motor pools, on 11th July 1991, that one of the worst one-day material losses in peacetime happened for the US military. One of these motor pool areas was being used as a wash point for vehicles when a fire began. The vehicles concerned belonged to the 2nd Squadron, US 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, the only part of the 11th Cavalry still in the base, as the other two squadrons had been deployed to the field on 11th July to serve as a deterrence against Iraqi aggression. The 3,600 or so personnel of the 11th ACR had only been in theater for around a month, having deployed from Germany and having taken no part in the war. The remaining squadron was now left behind to guard the base and maintain the vehicles. It was with the vehicles left behind that the accident happened, with the unit's vehicles packed tightly into rows in the motor pool. 
A row of M992 ammunition carriers was parked behind a line of M109 self-propelled guns and, a short distance north of the motor pool, was a line of M2 Bradleys. The fire began in the heater of one of the M992 ammunition carriers at around 10.20 that day. The vehicle was laden with 155mm artillery shells and, as such, the fire was a major concern. Despite the valiant efforts of the men to fight the fire, it grew worse, and, with the vehicle and those next to it la laden with shells, the decision was quite correctly made to abandon the fire and evacuate for safety. This was still on the way at 1100 hours, when the first of several explosions took place. The first explosion took place in the original M992 in which the fire had started, and not only wrecked that vehicle, but also scattered artillery submunitions over numerous vehicles nearby. Each M992 was capable of holding up to 95 rounds, just like the first M992, the vehicles surrounding it were all laden with ammunition in anticipation of potential combat with Iraqi forces. As further vehicles caught fire and exploded, more vehicles were destroyed and numerous submunitions were scattered around, many of which did not go off or were damaged by the blast and fire. At noon that day, an hour after the first explosion, the 22nd Support Command reported that the entire motor pool had been engulfed in fire with up to 40 vehicles affected. More concerningly, and something which would cause more problems later, they also reported that a number of depleted uranium rounds were involved. A response, two and a half hours later at 14.30, advised troops to wear protective masks and to stay upwind of the scene which was to be considered a chemical hazard. However, most troops had their masks stored elsewhere, and no masked troops can be found in the photos of the incident. The explosions and fire continued for several hours, as a chain reaction through the vehicles, rattling windows as far away as Kuwait City, as the fire spread from one vehicle to another. Various connexes, small metal sheds used to store spare ammunition, also became engulfed along with the rubber, plastics and fuel in these vehicles. The fire was simply too big and too dangerous to fight. It had to be left to burn itself out. After several hours, around 1600 hours, it was possible for some kind of assessment to be made of the damage to what was a combat-ready unit in a high-risk zone post-war. Numerous troops had been injured in the dash to safety, as troops scattered from the northern compound, although there were no fatalities. Some 50 US and 6 British troops reported injuries, ranging from fractures to cuts, bruises and sprains, as many were hurt climbing the perimeter fence to get away. Dozens of buildings were seriously damaged, and the photos of the vehicles caught up in the fire showed the scale of the damage. Some 102 vehicles were lost during the accident, including 3 M1A1 Abrams, an unknown number of M992 ammunition carriers, and other vehicles from Humvees to bridge layers. It was, however, not the vehicle losses which were the most serious fallout from this accident, but the cleanup. The M1A1s which were lost had, like the M992s, been loaded with ammunition ready for deployment. Unlike the M992s, however, these rounds were not mostly explosive filled, but were in fact primarily armor piercing, fin stabilized discarding sable type rounds made with depleted uranium. Burned and scattered all over the site, there was a total of 15 million US dollars worth of ammunition destroyed, including 660 of those APF SDS rounds, specifically the M829A1 120mm round. The 20.9 kg 120mm M829A1 APFSDS was colloquially known as the Silver Bullet, the cure for Soviet supply tanks in the Iraqi army. Each shell was filled with 7.9 kg of propellant, firing the 4.6 kg 38mm diameter 684mm long dart at around 1575 meters per second. The three M1A1s which were lost had been in the washdown area during the fire and were completely gutted. A fourth vehicle was damaged but not burnt out. 
Each of the tanks was loaded with around 37 M829A1 DU LEP FSDS rounds. More DU rounds were stored in the mill van trailers in connexes, and all of the ammunition in the free burnt out Abrams was destroyed. All four of the M1A1s were damaged, destroyed as a result of fires external to the vehicle. There were no penetrations anywhere on the exterior armor. Three of the four M1A1s had their fuel and ammunition destroyed. In these three cases, there was an explosion in the ammunition compartment. The ammunition doors and blowout panels functioned properly, keeping the explosion from entering the crew compartment. The fourth M1A1 was damaged on the right suspension only, and, except for the gunner's computer and transmission warning lights, was completely operational. The damage to the suspension system, however, was extensive. Blame for the burnt-out status of the tanks was not placed on the ammunition, but on the fuel, saying, It is believed that the catastrophic destruction of three of the M1A1s was due to the ignition of the fuel and subsequently the ammunition. The intensity of the heat adjacent to the suspension-damaged M1A1 was sufficient enough to melt aluminum, and it was this type of heat which caused the fuel in the other vehicles to ignite. The day after the fire, a formal damage assessment was begun, having notified US Army Armament Munitions and Chemical Command AMCOM, and Army Communications Electronics Command CECOM, beforehand as required. AMCOM was to decontaminate the M1A1 tanks, and CECOM was supposed to remove them. The first week of cleanup would have to take place without any radiological support from the Army, and relied only on the resources from the 11th Armored Cavalry instead. For this task, 11th ACR drew on 12 personnel from 146 Ordnance Detachment Explosive Ordnance Disposal, 54th Chemical Troop, and 58th Combat Engineer Company. Access could not be gained to the site immediately due to concerns over the delayed action artillery submunitions on both the north and south compounds, meaning the whole area was sealed off for three days. During this time, a plan of action was developed. The large amount of unexploded ordnance of the site posed significant hazards, and the personnel cleaning it up were instructed not to touch any of the DU penetrators with bare hands. Instead, they were supposed to be picked up with gloves, wrapped in plastic, and then put into wooden boxes of oil drums. Most of the DU rounds found were located within a 120 meter radius of the three destroyed tanks, although the rounds on the ground were believed to have mainly come from the destroyed connexes rather than from the tanks. The shells within the ammunition bustle of the tanks, which went off, were mostly contained within that area, and the compartmentalization between the crew area and the ammunition was not compromised. The majority of the damage to the tanks had actually come from the fuel burning rather than from the ammunition fire. When the AMCOM team finally arrived at Doha, these containers of DU were placed inside one of the burned out Abrams tanks, and all three tanks were sent to the Defense Consolidation Facility at Fort Snelling, South Carolina. In the meantime, marking, movement and disposal was carried out locally. Three of the 54th Chemical Troop's six XM-93 Fox vehicles carried out radiological monitoring in the southern compound, well away from the actual DU ammunition, and despite having no specific training related to DU. On 18th July, troops from 54th Chemical Troop conducted a foot survey of radiation of the northern compound and found no trace, although the results were dubious due to the sensitivity of the handheld equipment used. The troops from the 58th Combat Engineer Company used engineering vehicles such as bulldozers and graders to clear away the debris and ordnance in the compound without proper safety briefings, as they were exposed to unexploded ordnance and even collected damaged DU ammunition without knowing they were hazardous. To underscore the serious hazards on the site, on 23rd July, during the cleanup operation, an explosion occurred. Two senior NCOs and a soldier from 58th Combat Engineer Company were killed when some of this ordnance exploded. In the aftermath of this, all cleanup was halted until mid-September, and a new team of experts and civilian contractors were brought in. The damaged and destroyed tanks were recovered back to the US, leaving the site on 2nd August. The remaining site was cleared. 
Cleanup was then passed over to the Environmental Chemical Corporation, the civilian contractors, in mid-September to finish work with around two-thirds of the compounds still needing to be cleared, a process which took through November. Several reports followed the incident, which could have been much worse. Three troops had died during the cleanup, four tanks lost, seven M109 and seven M992 ammunition carriers, four AVLBs, and 40 or so smaller and light vehicles, such as Humvees, amounting to around $23.3 million and about $14.7 million worth of ammunition were lost. An additional $2.3 million in damage was done to the buildings, and the cleanup cost even more. For the Abrams tanks, three clear lessons stood out. The first was the failure of the fire suppression systems, which could not activate as there was no power. Second was that the fire risk came not from the ammunition but from the fuel. And the final one was that the compartmentalized ammunition fires could be contained to the ammunition area safely. Most importantly though was a lot of study on fire safety with munitions and containers for them, which remains a lesson to this day. What was also left was a legacy of the damage from depleted uranium ammunition. Many troops who were there at the time, or for the cleanup, were exposed to depleted uranium and other chemicals, both hazardous and radioactive. Many needlessly. To this day, many of these soldiers report ongoing health problems. That's all for this video. Make sure to like, subscribe and hit that bell button. We'll be releasing new videos on the regular. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or Reddit. If you use Discord, there's a link to our community server in the description. And if you would like to help us continue to develop and expand, please consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be used to help us enhance and design new articles and features for you. Until next time, keep us in your sights.